go through, yeah, um, as we start this presentation, neither Dr. Maley nor myself nor any other member um, of this uh, ECHO team has any financial arrangements uh, related to the content of this activity. So yeah, today's talk, to, uh, we're going to focus on sort of assessment and screening uh, for substance use disorders. Um, so in the next half hour or so, we'll kind of appreciate really the importance of screening for substance use disorders, as well as co-occurring psychiatric illnesses. Um, and as I as we do that, really just to, just a um, you know um, kind of wanted to underline the fact that according to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in their most recent guidelines that they released just about a year ago, you know they're really recommending universal screening um, in adults uh, for substance use disorders. So very important and consistent with USPSTF um, um, you know recommendations. We'll go over, you know, recommended models for screening and assessment. And I know Dr. Mealy does a wonderful job of really trying to distinguish between what is screening, what is assessment, what is the role of each before introducing kind of um, standards for doing those and reviewing the common screening tools that may be used in primary care and specialty setting. Thank you. Next slide, please. So as we go through here, so this is just kind of, um, you know, I just kind of want to um, set this up, um, you know, expand this. So as we know, right, um, you know, substance use, hazardous substance use or substance misuse is all too common in our country, right? This is older data and, and uh, you know, but still you can see that, you know, over half of Americans age 12 and over reported being um, current drinkers of alcohol, right? And almost 6% of Americans age 12 and over reported heavy drinking, right? And another 10% of Americans aged 12 and over uh, reported using illicit drugs in 2013 with cannabis being the most commonly used illicit drug. You know, and as we know, right, the rates of especially not just opioids, right, but also methamphetamines have risen even in the last year as the COVID pandemic has progressed and it has strained, um, you know, some of our treatment systems, some of our prevention and education systems, as well as maybe leading to things like isolation Right, mental mental health concerns, um, psychological, um, you know, just just you know, psychological concerns. We've seen rates of substances as well as overdose mortalities rise, and at the same time, treatment for substance use disorders, specialty treatments, become so difficult to access. Right, um, you know, so if you think about all the Americans, roughly ten percent can benefit from treatment for substance use disorders. But out of those, only about 10% who need treatment actually receive this specialty treatment. And I was actually reviewing the more recent data on it, and this hasn't shifted much, right? Even now in 2021, it's really about 10%, 11% of people who could benefit from specialty treatment for substance use disorder are actually able to receive this treatment, right? And there are many factors for it, and there is a lot of literature that has looked at it. Part of it is the stigma which we do a presentation on, of course, related to substance use. Also the cost of accessing treatment, some of it may or may not be covered by insurances, et cetera. Lack of interest, or I would add to that pertinent to this, to this talk, lack of even the understanding or knowledge that I could benefit from this treatment, right? And lack of availability, which remains a major issue, especially in rural areas of the country. Again, citing recent data, you know, even in 20, it's okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, even in 2018, which is the most recent data I'm aware of, over half of rural counties in the United States don't have a single provider who is able to prescribe buprenorphine. So this is a major issue, right? So while specialty substance use disorders treatment is so hard to come by, very few people are able to access it, think about primary care, right? Especially with the Affordable Care Act, you know, majority of adults and children are able to see a primary care provider, right? You can see that within the course of a year, you know, vast majority of adults and children see a healthcare providers and over half of those visits are primary care visits. There are also emergency departments, right? That people are able to access, probably not the greatest use of our resources, but the emergency departments are there and provide a safety net, right? So next slide, please. So therein rise the opportunity, right? So we've got all these people with substance use disorders, maybe even a rising prevalence of substance use disorders with specialty treatment that's so hard to access. However, 
a more ready access to primary care settings and to a lesser extent emergency departments, right? Kind of quote unquote general medical settings. So then can medical settings, general medical settings, you know, allow us the opportunity to reach those individuals who may have substance use disorders or maybe that haven't developed substance use disorders but are on their path, right? They're displaying hazardous use patterns. So can that give us that chance to connect with those individuals who may never otherwise go see a specialty addictions treatment clinic or those with milder substance use problems that don't require specialty treatment, that don't necessarily need everything that, for example, the UNM ASAP clinic offers. So can we use those medical settings to best reach that, those patients? And if so, how can we best help those individuals? How can we both help those patients? That's the overall rationale. Next slide, please. Um, you know, and, um, and, and that's really where we come in with, with kind of the, some of the screening and assessment models, you know, to help providers understand what patients' needs are and match them to the right services to meet those needs. What's their level of need and what are the right uh, services for those needs? And also to help providers track symptoms over time and adjust treatment accordingly so we're best helping our patients. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Maley. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Great, great uh, foundation for, to help us start start this talk. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to go through a lot of content in a very brief amount of time. Only have a little less than, than 20 minutes to go over some real big picture stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of globally why um, the, the assessments that we're recommending, the screenings that we're recommending are so important. Um, I want to briefly touch on two different models of screening that, that have had a lot of dissemination and really good evidence to support them, and that's ASAM and ESPERT. And then I'm going to um, show you guys some, some recommended public domain screeners that could be implemented in any setting by any provider, and then um, just very quickly show you um, some screeners for mental health conditions and then uh, some, some assessments. So what are those comprehensive assessments that um, if you're interested or if that's your role and you're looking, you can have that. It's a lot of content in each of these slides. So I'm gonna move pretty quick. You will be getting a copy of these slides. And if you have any questions about the details, just feel free to, um, to reach out to, to Rana and she can connect you to, to one of us and we're, we're happy to, to help. Um, so that being said, I wanna start out with, with um, introducing this concept as substance use uh, providers in, in, in our field, um, in our history, we have really had a tendency to focus on the acute needs. So, so when someone is in active relapse or, uh, or they're, they're having um, a, a resurgence of, of acute symptomatology, we tend to treat them there. And that's kind of where that 28 day rehab, all, all that sort of stuff came out of. Now, um, so these are showing you uh, the two different models that, that have generated a lot of our screening and assessment processes. So you can see that patients would come in either with a diagnosis or without a diagnosis into the program. And we're really focusing on their problems or their complications. We treat them and then we send them back out. We don't see them again until a relapse. Um, so, so that's kind of the history of where a lot of this stuff has developed. We now know that that's not necessarily the most helpful way to treat uh, patients with substance use disorder because this is a chronic condition. Um, we really need to be thinking about this more as a cyclical process and that people move up and down a continuum of care, but there needs to be a continuum of care. And we need to have the ability to assess patients' um, level of severity and match them to the right recommended treatment rather than having kind of this one size fits all approach and really only treating patients um, kind of in that more acute or severe phase that we really need to be catching them prior to getting there and keeping them out of getting there. So this shows you kind of a different way of looking at, um, at assessing for multiple dimensions when, when we do screeners and, and assessments and being able to determine what is that comprehensive biopsychosocial treatment plan, what's the intensity that's recommended, the level of care that's recommended, and, and educating patients and their supports on how to move up and down that continuum. So thinking about where we are today is really understanding that we, we need to be treating episodes of care um, and, and understand where we fit into that continuum of care. So, so recognizing that, that a lot of patients are gonna benefit 
from kind of an intensive treatment, especially if they're coming to us in that more, more acute phase, but then they're also gonna need maintenance care or aftercare planning. Um, and they might actually come to an outpatient treatment provider and need to go to that higher level specialty care and or um, IOP or residential program, and then step back down through the levels. So really thinking you as a provider and your system, where do you fit into that continuum and what episode of care are you actually working on and what's gonna be needed um, um, after, after you complete that. Um, so, so that's where screening can really come into play, especially if you're somebody who fits more in this sort of prevention place, so a primary care provider or general mental health, where you're not necessarily, you're not working in a substance abuse specialty location like those of us that work at ASAP, you need to have the ability to screen for people before they get to needing our services. Because a lot of really good work could be done at that level and or patients that might be coming out of our services, they need ongoing screening to, to make sure that we're monitoring um, uh, are they getting close? Are they, are they increasing in their, in their use? So this helps you to think about where did the majority of, of people really fit? The vast majority of the population is going to fall in this lower half of the pyramid where they're really in low risk or, or they're abstaining, they're not using substances that we're worried about. We don't really need to do much, but just continue to screen routinely and keep an eye on them. This is the same mindset that we have for depression. It's why a lot of um, facilities will use the PHQ-9 regularly at the dermatologist Psychologists, you know, or at their dentist's office, why, why we're screening for that in places where we're not seeking depression treatment, but um, we want to keep an eye on it because the consequences of that condition getting out of control um, can be really severe. So the same thing is with substance use, right? We want to be screening at that lower level, recognizing that we, that we actually can handle a lot of things, just keeping an eye on it. Or even once they move up to that next tier, they're kind of in that risky use category with brief intervention with their current provider. We don't actually need to send them to specialty treatment until they get up to that harmful dependent level. And so this is a nice um, breakdown and it gives you some screeners I'm gonna go over here in a minute, the audit and the DAST and the scores that would correlate with one of the, with needing to recommend to specialty treatment. Now I wanna move in and briefly introduce you to some models that can be used to kind of get this pyramid going in your, in your setting. So ASAM is one, is one uh, model that really provides a comprehensive assessment program. Um, it, is, uh, it is endorsed by New Mexico. We are an ASAM state, so it is um, required by substance use providers that we get training in this. We know how to use this to level people based on ASAM criteria. Now, if you haven't had training in it, a lot of the screeners I'm going to show you actually line up with ASAM criteria. So on the back end, even though you may not have training in this comprehensive, um, this comprehensive model, um, you can still kind of be familiar with understanding, oh, this, this number equals this ASAM level of criteria. So this is the ASAM placement uh, diagram. Um, there's a, a, a lot of detail in here that I'm not gonna get to in this lecture. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to get some additional training. Um, but it's essentially a process that says everybody gets screened. That screening would lead to a more comprehensive assessment, which would allow us to make a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. That diagnosis would then also let us level the severity and we also need to be looking at all of these things called placement criteria. So we need to be looking at their, their risk for intoxication and withdrawal, their biomed biomedical um, variables. Where are they at from an emotional behavioral standpoint? How accepting are they or motivated for treatment are they? Where are they in that stage of change um, cycle? Um, what is their, their risk for relapse um, if, if they don't get treatment, if they're not currently using? And then what kind of an environment is, is recommended um, for optimal recovery. And then that, that leads to a decision in terms of level of care. Because what we know um, on this continuum of care is that there are a lot of different options where patients might fall. Um, anywhere from community level peer support all the way to medically managed acute detox, right? And our CPT codes line up with this continuum of care. And we also know that the research is really clear that when we don't match patients correctly to the right level of care, then they don't get optimal outcomes. We don't want to send patients who don't need residential treatment to residential facility that could actually make them worse. And they might, they might um, not engage as effectively with treatment um, in a way that could prevent negative outcomes and vice versa. If we have someone that really does need IOP or higher and we're maintaining 
maintaining them at the outpatient level, we're probably doing a disservice. And so there's a lot of, these are just some um, uh, research studies that show you how important it is to make sure that patients are matched effectively, that outcomes really are contingent on having some kind of an assessment process that allows us to level appropriate care for folks. So ASAM is a really good model. Um, it has good face validity, it's highly reliable, um, um, and, and shows us kind of how to follow that system. So if you're not familiar with it and would be interested, I'd highly encourage you to get some, get some more information on ASAM. Another model that looks at from, from like a systems perspective, how to assess for patients and what's, what's recommended um, is called ESPERT. And I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this. It's, done, it's been widely disseminated. There's a lot of free trainings and tools available on SAMHSA. It stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. So similarly to, uh, to the ASAM, everybody gets screened. It doesn't matter what, what facility they're coming into, they get screened for substance use disorder. And if they're positive on that screen, then you do what's called a brief intervention. So, so there's a lot of really great tools. I've given you the link for actually the SPERT app you can download on your phone that kind of walks you through how to do these six steps, how to do a brief intervention with somebody so that um, you, can, you can coach them in that moment and have a clear discussion of, do they need to follow up with me as their primary care provider um, or, or nurse practitioner, or do I need to send them to specialty care to, to follow up with that because of the level of severity? So this is the SPERT um, graphic that again says, everybody gets screened. And the recommendation is they get screened at every encounter because people don't see their primary care providers you know, um, frequently. It, it, a lot of time can go by and a lot of things can change between visits. And so making sure that you're screening everybody using one of these uh, uh, standardized instruments. If they fall into the, the low risk, then you just keep screening. You don't really need to do anything. They're in that prevention category. If they fall into moderate risk, that's where you do that brief intervention where you can provide them education about their use and coach them to sort of decrease their use to a healthier level. If they're following into moderate um, or high risk category, then you might need to step that up to using motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement techniques in your work with them. And if they fall into severe, then they probably are gonna need a referral to some next level of care. As part of that continuum, they're gonna to need to go to either specialty outpatient or an IOP or something, depending on how you look. So those are the big picture models. Now I wanna move into showing you some, some screeners that could be applied under both of these umbrellas. So we use these terms interchangeably, screening and assessment, but screening really is just about targeting any unhealthy or problematic substance use. Um, and the goal is to be able to detect kind of like broad strokes. We're not getting into the details with a screener. So they tend to be brief, easy to administer, written at a lower grade level, so pretty much anyone can take them. Um, that's versus assessment. Um, assessments typically happen after a screening. So screening kind of occurs um, right at, at every encounter and it sort of filters through. If they're positive on a screener, then you move on to assessment, which tends to be gathering a lot more information. And that's how you can actually lead to a diagnosis. You're not gonna use a screener for diagnosis. You're gonna to need to go to that next level of assessment to make a mental health um, a, a diagnosis such as a substance use disorder. Um, and, you, and that's where you're gonna really determine, okay, what's the next steps for this person? And you can develop that biopsychosocial treatment plan. Um, so here are some common screening tools that are public domain and can be used with a substance use disorder population. Um, you can you see I've broken them out. Some are alcohol specific, some are uh, for general, some are for adolescent population, some are for adult, and some are used as um, withdrawal indicators. So the cows and the siwa are used to kind of monitor for, for um, where somebody is at in terms of of are we gonna be um, able to prescribe or, or is this a medical emergency? Do we need to, to get them um, medical intervention? So I just wanna show you some of these briefly if you're not familiar with them. The cage is one of our older, one of our older ones. It's really brief, it's just four questions and it's looking specifically at alcohol use. Um, if, you're, if you don't have a routine screener for alcohol use, alcohol is still one of our most problematic issues in the country and in, in, in our state. So I highly recommend that you don't just screen for um, illicit substances, but you also screen for alcohol. And especially with patients that um, you're working with that have a known substance use disorder, we wanna be monitoring alcohol because that could come online 
at any time. Um, so, so thinking about something that can be helpful. The nice thing about the cage is it has this like graphic that shows patients how to kind of measure standard drinks and you can provide some good education with it. Here are the questions. It's just a yes or no. So it's really easy to administer and get the information. The problem with that is it doesn't give us a lot of specificity and doesn't give us any information about uh, frequency of use. Um, so that's where the audit can come into play. The audit was developed from taking information from the cage um, by the, the World Health Organization. And they break it into different uh, scores for women and men. So you get a little more specificity there. And it also gives you time capture. So the difference between the audit and the audit three is audit three is the first three questions. So if you just, if you're strapped for time or you just wanna screen everybody, you can just give them the audit three. And if they're positive, then have them take the rest of the questions. But if they're negative on the first three, then they don't need to answer the rest. Um, so this line is differentiating the difference between the audit three um, and the full audit. The DAST is another instrument that gives us a, a little more information. Um, and this one is general. This has an adolescent version um, and an adult version. It also has a 10 item version and a 20 item version. So you can do a short or a long form. And, it, and it's focused on the consequences of your substance use. So this could be for alcohol, marijuana, opiates, whatever, whatever they're identifying as the problematic substances that they're using, then they can take the DAST and it tells you, okay, how much functional impairment is present rather than just how much are they using um, or how often are they using. The other nice thing about the DAST is this aligns with ASAM criteria. So the score that you get on the DAST will tell you the recommended level of care. So even if you haven't been trained in ASAM, if you start um, applying the DAS regularly, it can be really informative to help you make sure that you're leveling patients uh, correctly, that you're recommending the right level of treatment. The Enum Assist is another really great tool that also lines up with uh, ASAM criteria. It does not stand for New Mexico. It stands for NIDA Modified Alcohol Smoking and Substance Involvement Screening Test. This is a great tool um, you can do a paper version. There is a paper version that you can get, but it is also a web-based interactive tool that aligns with um, ASAM and SBIRT, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's, it gives you an eight question uh, initial screener asking about 10 different substance classes. And then depending on how the patient answers those eight questions, then it skips through the next question. So they don't have to do the whole thing they only have to answer questions related to the uh, substances that they endorse, that they, they are currently using. I've given you the link to get to this, um, to this tool. It's really great if you're not familiar with it, I would highly encourage you to check it out. Um, the nice thing about this one um, is that after they take the whole thing, then it lines up with SBIRT and tells you as the provider, some uh, questions or some things that you can say to them as part of that brief intervention protocol. And then the ASAM says what's recommended in terms of follow-up care. So this is kind of an all-in-one shebang kind of screener. Um, and then most people I think are familiar with the cows and Siwa, but we wanted to include these as well, just in case you're not. These are really helpful for using um, when you're gonna be starting with somebody uh, on medications or you, we just wanna make sure that they're safe to continue. So routinely we'll do the cows and see well with people at the beginning of an intake encounter because we wanna make sure that somebody isn't in act, really severe active withdrawal um, before we start this long kind of assessment process. So this is a good one that you can use for multiple reasons. And then the last screener that, that we really recommend is making sure that you have some sort of process for regularly checking UDAs and, and and keeping an eye on some of that objective data um, because pa the rest that I showed you are all patient self-report. Um, and so this can be a nice one to, to augment that because it kind of tells us, so what are people um, using? And, and this is where we have some really good conversations with people, particularly around fentanyl, because we know that that's in our community um, and patients don't always know that they're taking it. Sometimes it's mixed in with their methamphetamines or their you know, marijuana or wherever they're, what other drugs they're using, they're not always aware that fentanyl's in there. And so regularly doing a UDA can help you to catch that and have a really good conversation with people about like, where are they getting their supply and kind of do a harm reduction approach. Um, really quickly, I wanted to just give you some, uh, some jargon to go with mental health screeners. So those were all substance use screeners. These are recommended public domain mental health screeners. That, um, that are also really helpful to give to people regularly. Um, and this goes through the, the PHQ-9, which is a depression inventory, the GAD-7, which is for generalized anxiety or just can be for general anxiety conditions. 
The PCPTSD um, is a general um, PTSD rule out. It's just five questions. And if they're yes on any of those, you can follow it up with a PCL5, but it prevents you from having to do a full PTSD screen. The WHO DAS is looking at functionality and then the quality of life inventory is. And then the WHO QUAL is just a general uh, quality of life, general health inventory. And you can get all of these on the SAMHSA website. Now, the difference between screening and assessment, assessment includes all of these components. So there's a lot of components that need to go into doing an assessment. And, in, and when you guys do your general HMP, um, that's what you're doing, right? You've already done your screeners. You've determined this person needs treatment for this condition. So I'm gonna review all of this information, including getting collateral, which is really helpful, doing a chart review and any other standardized assessments like these things um, to augment and make sure that you're making an accurate diagnosis and helping to determine what's the next step for that individual. So not all of these are public domain. Some of these you do have to pay for, um, but these are, are endorsed um, by, by SAMHSA and the uh, NIDA and NIH as being really helpful standardized norm reference assessments. And so the Addiction Severity Index, the ASI, um, is free if you do the PDF version, but you do have to pay for a subscription if you wanna do the web-based tool. The brief symptom inventory goes through a number of mental health conditions as well as substance use disorder. And that one, uh, you do also have to pay for a, a, a subscription. The opioid treatment index is not just for people with opioid use. It does assess for that, but it assesses for general substance use, general health, criminality, high-risk behaviors. This one is public domain. This is a real, very similar to the ASI. It was just developed in, in, um, in Europe. And then these other ones are specific to substance use. So the timeline follow back in the form 90. And they tend to be mostly used in research protocols, but they give you really great information in terms of if someone's really struggling to self-report their use history, you could pull out one of these and get a much more comprehensive big picture of how have they been using and for, for how long. So I know that was a lot of information to throw at you guys, but, we, but you'll have the slides and we want